one. Hey everybody, my name is John DiPietro and I wanna take this time to welcome you to a special edition of My Life with Kenny Rogers. But before you run away and say, who is John DiPietro and why is his life with Kenny Rogers of interest to me? Let me tell you that we're not gonna be talking about my life with Kenny Rogers, but the life of our guest. Actually, it's an encore appearance um, because he was so good the first time that we asked him, hey, do you have any stories? See, because in our, in our part one with T.G. Engel, we got into some stories that don't appear anywhere. They don't appear in the rec back of the record jackets. They don't appear in any of the press releases. They don't appear anywhere except if you were in the deepest, deepest darkest caverns of the beginning years of Kenny Rogers. And as we found out previously, and we're gonna find out more again today, there are some great stories of people who are very successful, but the stories are even cooler when they're not yet a rock star. So with that being said, we have invited T.G. Engel back. And T.G., before we get into those special stories, give us a 30-second elevator uh, pitch about the years that you worked with Kenny and, and what position you played in the band. Well, I played guitar for him when uh, he split from the first edition. The first edition had just broken up. Kenny hadn't had a hit record in about five years. And he was making his comeback and he moved to Nashville. I was playing in Nashville at the time. And then uh, you picked a fine time to leave me. Lucille came out and his career just took off like a skyrocket. So mm -hmm. we're at that time in history when Lucille had just been released on the radio and it was really a hot record, but we were still playing clubs. Okay, yeah, that's and I think we said yesterday, and somebody questioned me on this. I said to you, was it was it a couple sets a night? And you said sometimes it was four and five sets a night, which meant what, you started at nine o'clock and, and ended at one in the morning, and what, you did 50 minutes and 10 off, or 45 and 15, but... That, that was in Las Vegas. We would do the four and five sets a night, but Kenny only did two shows a night. Okay, yeah. okay. You know, I was going to say, it, it seemed very easy that... Um, during uh, the times when Kenny was doing tents in, in theaters, yeah. he was sometimes in a city and yeah. doing two shows, like a four o'clock and a seven o'clock, or like if it was a casino in Connecticut, he mm -hmm. would do a nine o'clock and an 11 o'clock or eight o'clock and 11 o'clock show. And right. it didn't phase him to do that, but little uh -huh. did we know that uh, those early years before it was arena time, yeah. it was a couple sets a night and, um, the Always band would play hear. three sets and Kenny would do two. So that was five sets for us. But Steve Wynn, bless his heart, paid us very well for five sets. I mean, he was, uh, and I'm not saying this just to uh, flatter him, but he was a good guy. So he's not cheap. I mean, he paid us very well. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So there were a couple um, additional stories that you said would be of interest to our viewers. Set, give me the backstory on them and okay. then tell us what went on. So uh, Lucille had just been released. It was the hot thing. Uh, it was the hot record in the country. And he had already booked certain dates and he would always honor his dates. He could have gotten an, probably an arena gig, but if he booked a, a club gig, he would go ahead and play it. Although he was way too big just you know, overnight to play at it. It was a place in Hollywood called the Palomino Club, a very famous uh, country and western club and then the warm-up band was the great John Hobbs playing piano who hadn't even moved to Nashville yet. John Hobbs of the Nashville Palace? Yeah, yeah. That guy? Yeah, yeah. The, that is so uh, funny. The Nashville Pickers, I'm not sure what they, anyway he was that one of the A-team uh, recording, uh, session recording piano players and uh, he had played with a famous jazz uh, not her Ellis, but it, it, he was a, a great jazz. He was known as a jazz player and he could play bebop, advanced jazz, and he could also play Floyd Kramer style piano. He was just great. And another great guitar player named Billy Walker. So uh, we're getting ready to go on at the Palomino. It's in between sets and we're just hanging out. The two twin brothers who you've seen in the James Bond movies, they're each about six foot eight and they have gold teeth. Remember oh, yeah. those guys? They were there. So they come in the dressing room 
And my brother, Dick Engel, lived in Newport Beach at the time in California, and he's in the dressing room. And um, a lot of times I would just play my classical guitar to get warmed up between shows. Between shows, um, yep. I'm playing my classical guitar. And all of a sudden, my brother says, hey, Kenny, can you sing Since I Left You, Baby by uh, Ivory Joe Hunter? And Kenny goes, sure. So I can still remember. I hit a D chord, and Kenny sang Since... Since I Met You, Baby, Since I Met You, Baby. You know that old song? Mm -hmm. And it was just absolute magic. It was one of those once in a lifetime moments. Everybody just stopped what they were doing in the dressing room. And when we get through, we all went, Whew. It, it was just incredible. I'll never forget as long as I live. It's one of the best songs I've ever heard him sing. And he never recorded it. And I wish he would have. It's never, so it never got to be part of the show. Never, but it was um, part of the act. You I didn't say, "Hey, let's." My, yeah, my try brother, that tonight, Kenny. My brother Dick's the one who kicked it off. And the other story I have about him is when I learned about protocol, and uh, that's a fancy word for the pecking order. So we were playing a job, getting ready to go on stage, and we had pulled up in a station wagon. And for some reason, Kenny was stuck in the back where there are no seats. And we're all leaving, and he says, "Somebody open the door! Open the door!" Kenny's the star. Yeah. And right. He, he's stuck in the back yeah. where you have to like scrunch. Yeah. So not thinking, going back to my childhood, I said, what's the magic word, Kenny? <laughs> and he yelled. He was really mad. He said, paycheck, damn it. Paycheck. That's when I learned protocol. Protocol. Okay. Yeah. Now, was that before or after you said, I'm not going to carry your guitar? I'm not your guitar valet. Before, I've only seen him married mad two times. One time when I wouldn't I hand him his guitar in that time when I, uh, when I, when I asked him the magic word, and that that's when I learned. Oh, you better not do that. Yeah. So that now, so you weren't around. You were gone by the time the Jets arrived. So you never got to. Uh, he didn't put you into the toilet or anything in the. Uh, no, no, no. In the in the lavatory of no. the Jets. But so. playing those small places was really good practice for playing the good arenas because you got to sound good in a small place. There's nowhere to hide. I mean, nothing was miked. Uh, sometimes uh, the singers wouldn't even have monitors. They couldn't hear what they were singing. And uh, Gene Golden, Bobby Daniels, and Steve Glassmeyer, they could sing without monitors perfectly on pitch. Uh, Kenny could sing if he couldn't hear himself, if there was no monitor there. It was really good training because I think that's where the band got a lot of their, their sound and their training from. So were these, were th by clubs, Mm -hmm. You mean where people would, um, would, was there still a bar that was in range? There was a the, bar in the back and waitresses were serving drinks and everybody was like, a lot of people like one or two feet from the stage. It was a very intimate setting. And uh, if you go over in a place like that, it's a, then you can go over in a big coliseum. You, you've got to have the sound. The sound and the way to, um, I, I guess you, you learn to block out distractions pretty well because if somebody, you know, if a, if a server drops a yeah. tray of drinks yeah. right in the middle of a love song, right. you've got to be able to really, um, did, did you ever see any situations where they were, um, um, you know, less than optimal performing conditions that Kenny had to go through? And, uh, and sometimes we play know? outside. And I don't know if you've ever played an instrument, but it's really hard to play the guitar with cold hands, especially when you've got those metal strings. That was about the, uh, the only time. Um, but uh, getting back to the noise in the club, Kenny's the kind of guy that if a waitress dropped a, tray of, a tray of drinks and interrupted his show, he would never say anything about it because they're doing their job. He, he understood this is a nightclub. I don't expect it to be real quiet, but we never had any trouble with fans or anything like that. Yeah. Nobody that was there um, to have okay. a beer yeah. and um, yeah. didn't, didn't care who the, act, who the act was up on stage? No hecklers. Uh, we were playing in Saudi Arabia in 1976, of all places, and we would go to these camps, these Aramco oil camps, out in the middle of nowhere. And th there'd maybe be 30 people there, but Aramco had enough money to pay them. And somebody wanted to hear, they kept screaming for the Battle of New Orleans. In 1814, we took a little, and he kept saying, I don't know it. And I said, I know it. And he put the microphone in, in front of me and wanted me to sing. And 
singing is not my uh, it's not forte. my ballet. It's not my forte. And I think Steve Glassmeyer sang it instead. But they, it was a very good back and forth. It was it was a lot of fun. But Never. Uh, you want to see Kenny Rogers and you want him to sing the Battle of New Orleans by Johnny Horton? I, I don't get it. But then again, this was was this prior to um, Lucille Lucille had, and Islands. Oh, this is way before Islands in the Stream. Uh, Lucille had not hit yet. Um, this was uh, uh, when he had his first comeback album. Okay. Just so you're, you're getting started. gigs, but yeah. they're still not um, gigs. They're, you're not doing the Superdome in New Orleans. No, definitely not. Not definitely. doing the Astrodome in Houston and uh, any any of those type things. It be a small but, stage, but it was still fun. I mean, that the music was great. You know, from a from a performer's perspective, it appears though that many of the people that I've talked to, you know, through these Kenny shows, they really enjoyed playing in the small venues because they could really look into the eyes of the customer, right? right? right. And Kenny would do Sweet Music Man all by himself playing acoustic guitar. And it, like I said, it was very intimate. But going back to the dressing room, you can imagine these two giants that we've seen in music and they were just awestruck. They were like, oh my gosh. It was, it was just a magical moment when he sang the Ivory Joke. Oh, that's songs. right. <laughs> Those were the guys. That's right. We started talking about the Goldfinger or the James Bond guys. Yeah. So they're in the locker room. They're I'm, in the dressing, the dressing room. room. And they're about, I, they had to be close to seven feet tall. And they were really, really nice guys. They're, they're nothing like they are in the movies. And they were smiling. And uh, it, was, it, was just, it was just wonderful. Wild. Wild. Anything else? along those lines about, because um, I always ask Steve Glassmeyer and Chuck and those guys, where was the craziest place they remembered playing? And they, I think they said in Mexico City um, or Thailand, one of the two, but it was a, it was an arena that they had cockfighting in <laughs> when they weren't doing the show and there was dirt on the floors and, and a lot of people came that night thinking that it was the regular night and not a musical night. And they said, um, you know, one row was uh, where Chuck would stand would be two feet higher than Steve, which would be two feet higher than Kenny because they're in a, they're in a, um, you know, a building that was more like a, an arena, like a bullfighting arena, if you will. When we played in Saudi Arabia, we were driving through the desert to uh, either Udman Leah or oof oof somewhere. And uh, there's this Arab guy riding his camel and I'm not making this up. And you know, the camel has humps and he, back then they had boom boxes and he had a big strap on his boom box and he had it over the camel's hump and he had it blaring and he's playing Folsom Prison Blues by Johnny Cash. I'm not on making it <laughs> on his camel. You know, it's funny you mentioned the camel because um... Oh, I don't know how many years ago it was, but the band played in Morocco wow. um, in Northern Africa. And I know that all the band, and I think Kenny, um, they all took camel rides, um, but they weren't riding bareback on the camel. There were those camels like at the county fair yeah. that have yeah. the big saddle, you know, the big straw uh, saddle on them. So evidently Kenny is a, um, <laughs> he's, He's ridden some camels before. So, and, uh, at the Marianne was with us, and I don't know if you know Marianne Gordon, but a beautiful lady. I mean, she was just really nice lady, just very good looking. And they told her to wear a veil in public. Mm. So we're in public looking at the gold markets in uh, Saudi Arabia. You know, they would sell gold just like you have gold in a 7-Eleven store because there's no crime over there. No one's going to steal anything. So. This the crimes for stealing are pretty severe, right? Yes, yeah, yeah. yeah. You, okay. you don't want to steal a Saudi Arabia. And this was in the 70s. And she had a veil over her face. And, and all the men in the street are whistling at me, like, at her, like, hey, baby, and whistling. I'm going, wow, I didn't know they were supposed to do that. She's got a veil on her face, but I guess they thought she was good looking. I, I never figured that one out. Oh, well, whatever. But we want to thank you so much for uh, letting thank us in on the, on the back stories because, um, Again, the comments that we got from the show that we did recently, everybody likes hearing the stories that you don't read in the press guides. And, um, you know, 
to it's me. all about the stories, isn't it? The, the stories and the fact that, like you said, the reason Kenny's career was as long as it was is because didn't smoke, didn't drink. Yeah. So yeah. his lungs and breathing and, yeah. Yeah. and yeah. capacity to, um, you know, perform uh, so many, so many nights a year, yeah. at least, you know, 100, 150 shows, um, you know, certainly went well beyond most other people in the industry as far as his length of time and uh -huh. his frequency of shows during that duration, you know, because there are other acts that come out, they're big for 10 right. years, yeah. then they take 20 years off and then they have their 30th anniversary year, yeah. when yeah. in fact they only work 10 out of the 30 years. Yeah. All right. so, and, uh, another thing about Kenny, the first time I heard him sing Lucille and the last time I heard him sing Lucille, both performances were equal in quality. He never walked through anything. Mm -hmm. So the thousandth time he had to sing his hit songs, he sang just as well as he did the first time. He, you know, he didn't just walk, the feeling was there, the passion was there, he could just turn it on. Yeah, and you know what, we talked about that uh, not too long ago where people that have longevity and so many hits don't like to do the same songs, they like right. to mix them up. In fact, there's a certain band that I remember that was playing three nights at Fenway Park that um, played a different show each night. So you only got a little of the hits yeah. each time. And again, the public that goes to the show, yeah. they want to hear the hits. Yeah, great. So anyway, so we want to thank you so much and um, so much. let people know that if you like this show and like the others, then down at the bottom right-hand corner of your screen, hit that subscribe button. You'll get them all. And based on our conversation, we're going to have a couple of names that mean nothing to you as far as being on stage with Kenny. But uh, T.G. Engel has hooked us up with a couple other people that are going to be able to uh, come on with us and okay. tell you some stories that will um, make you say, I didn't realize that Kenny had to go through that yeah. to get to where he got to. And I appreciate your interest. This is all part of music history. It's very important. Exactly. So okay. thank you so much, everyone. And we'll see you real soon. And uh, TG, let's go out. Okay. Glory. All right. <laughs> okay.